Hi, everyone. Well, tis the season for allergies, asthma, and in many parts of the country, it's also wildfire season. So this is causing a lot of sinus issues, respiratory issues for people all over the country, including my own family, as Dr. Maggie knows. So what should you do? Do you load up a medication or do you end up at the doctor's office? Dr. Yeah. Maggie is here with all the answers. Hi, Dr. Maggie. Yeah. And this really was brought on honestly by some of the issues you were having with your son, but also uh, in our programs, many people are experiencing symptoms right now. So we are in a confluence time. We're going into from fall, going into early winter. So lots of allergies, lots of asthma, and then a lot of part of the Pacific Northwest and a lot of other parts, and we'll talk more about it. It is wildfire season where there's lots of smoke and toxins from fires going into the air. And a lot of people live in areas where there's a lot of mold and we're coming into late fall or early winter, it's going to be mold season. So lots of exposures, lots of respiratory sinus issues, eye symptoms, hay fever, you name it. So today we're going to take a deep dive. It really was from conversations we, you and you and I just had this past weekend. So I figured why not? Why just share it with Anne? Let's just do it together. I'm, we're going to go into a deep dive today all about algaes, asthmas, wildfires, and toxins. Here we go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for Transform Table Talk Live. I'm Anna Emanuel alongside Dr. Maggie Yu, and I'm so thankful that you're doing this topic today, Dr. Maggie, because I think it is going to help a lot of people. It's extremely timely, and I can't wait to dive into it, but I'm sure you want to chat and say hello to everybody first. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Maggie, and the creator of the Transform System for turning around any chronic illness or symptom around naturally. And as you guys can see, there is some new digs here. <laughs> I love the way this looks. She's in a professional studio now. <laughs> It was always a professional studio. <laughs> it's just snazzier with a neon. Uh, I love color. And uh, as you guys can tell, look, 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 um, orange, yellow. I love bronzy, orange, yellow colors, right? Um, and this is also like when we're looking at the time of year we're in fall, you're thinking pumpkin spice, lots of oranges, colors, right? But it also heralds in, and look at the sign. These are some of my favorite colors, as you can see right here, right up there. Um, so for me, it is time to really talk about what is like getting airborne. What is getting airborne? And what kind of reactions are you dealing with, your kids, your family are dealing with? Start typing in chat. I mean, if, if something's resonating with you, how many of you, your hay fever has gotten a lot worse? Um, you're getting allergies for the first time or your child is. We're also rolling into the cusp of also cold and flu season, which makes algae and asthma symptoms worse or creates it in people who didn't have it. And you had not you had an experience with this. I did. I'll share my experience briefly. You know, back to school just happened within the last couple of weeks where I live. And of course, most of your children around the country are also just now getting back to school. And so we're getting all of these viruses are coming back into the picture. And so my son must have caught some little virus. I can tell you it wasn't the flu. It wasn't the big C. And it wasn't RSV. They tested him for all of them. Just a little mm -hmm. virus. But it triggered in him what the doctors now think is asthma. And so I was telling you about this and you were saying, you know what, this is exactly the time of year. This is exactly when we would see something like this potentially happen because of the conditions that we're seeing environmentally and also just the right mix of what's going on with cold and flu season as well. well so it as a parent, we, we need all the help we can get. Well, and the thing is you were thrown, like we're talking like an ER situation or urgent care type situation and how many parents or yourself are slapped the first time with the label of having asthma and you don't know anything about it and suddenly you have a label or your child has a label of having asthma. And I would, I was the first one when, you know, when I was talking to you to say, it's actually something I would call differently called reactive airway disease. I wouldn't be slapped. We, we can slap that as a label on it, but really it's more specific. It's reactive airway disease, which is that it is reactive to something. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the trigger could be particular viruses. Sometimes it could be actually pollen, smoke, toxins, you name it, in combination with a particular virus, and boom, your airways are reacting and suddenly your airway spasms, and that's what we call asthma, is the spasming of these airways. Mm -hmm. um, but it to, to me, honestly, what your son had was reactive airway disease, which I myself have, uh -huh. right? 
I'm not walking around with asthma 24 seven, you know, needing a rescue inhaler all the time, but I know that there are triggers here that triggers reactivity in my airway, depending on what the combination of factors that are happening. Yeah. And people, people in our audience are saying that they're experiencing the same thing. Also, somebody said they had several little asthma attacks this week. The smoke in their area is terrible. Mm-hmm. And you know, I do the news. I do the news for places all over the country and we're reporting that same thing. We've got burn bans going on in some parts of the country because the conditions are so dry. I'm getting air quality alerts where I live that the air in, the air in my area is not safe uh, for people with sensitive conditions. So this is extremely timely. We're all struggling with it. You yourself, I did not know struggle with this restrictive airway as well yeah. so a lot of people want to know are there solutions are there things that we yeah. can do to address it well and i love the audience is popping in rose is from the bay area and she's like the air quality was pretty bad yesterday due to the fires in northern cal i'm in the oregon washington border area there were fires in vernonia in oregon in washington there's a spokane fire canada last couple of weeks had all these fires so I want to put that in here because what fire does is when there's a burn and there's fire, smoke itself is a respiratory and sinus mucous membrane irritant. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is when there's a smoke, whether it's you know natural smoke, but also like when you have structures that are burning, right? Uh, when you're talking about structures that are burning, there's a lot of toxins that are released from our insulation, from the, the materials with which we build homes. So not only is there a smoke loan, uh, load, which is a irritant, but then now you're starting to get toxin load into, into the atmosphere. And these can travel large distances. So, you know, you may have fumes coming in from even in another country, but the way the airs come, it can actually, all of a sudden, you're in Arkansas, <laughs> right? And right near you. It's cold. Yeah. <laughs> and boom, it happens. It can trigger Arkansas. these reactions. Right. right. And it can get very serious. You know, for my son, we had to get emergency nebulizer treatment and on steroids and a rescue inhaler and the whole thing because he was wheezing so bad. So you don't want it to get to that point if there mm-hmm. are some things that you can do to kind of catch it and head it off. Yeah. What we're going to do later on in this um, in this training is I'm going to talk about how to allergy and decrease, how, how to allergy your proof your home, but how to also decrease allergen load and toxin load in general. So that's coming up. So you don't want to miss it. If you're watching right now and you know somebody who can benefit from this, tag their name in the comment section. If you're watching from YouTube and you appreciate this content, please give me a thumbs up and a like to help me with the algorithms because I want more people to see this. Uh, Today, we're just going to be giving you a lot of educational information. So if you have a pen, if you have a paper, start writing, get it next to you and get ready to write because I want to do actually uh, training around, you know, not your typical, hey, here are the medications, uh, you know, Zyrtec, Claritin, whatever the medications are. Okay, we know those things. And the thing is, is that people are loading up on those things. They're available over the counter. If they work and that's all you needed and that's the route you want to go, great, right? But what people don't know about, I want to talk about out-of-the-box ways to actually deal with allergens that can be equally, if not more, um, more um, effective, especially mm-hmm. when you're dealing with not just adults, but with kids as well. Understanding of these natural ingredients and techniques is really important. So I'm here to teach about the why today natural ingredients that can be more effective. And this isn't just Dr. Maggie making this up. I mean, there have been so many studies and discussions, mm-hmm. medical discussions, um, articles written about this as well. But yeah. I know you have found a way to combine all of the best of the best into one curated list for everybody. So I'm really excited to hear more about that. So we're going to get started talking about natural ingredients that are clinically proven and shown to actually be really helpful with any of the symptoms we're talking about. We've curated it in the MYMD shop. We actually have an allergy collection. So you don't have to memorize everything. And if you want to be, if you want to get the cliff note version, hop over to the allergy collection right with me right now, whether it's on your phone or on your desktop, as I go, like you can actually, as you click on some of these products, you'll be remembering what I'm talking about here. So in the allergy collection, if you look at it, there's a variety of things. And so it's not a one size fits all. And there's many ways with which you can approach it allergy. So as, and as we go through some of these, these are just helping me prompt to actually remind you at, to think about the different ways and tools with which we could approach allergies. So number one, the number one um, best product to start with is Sinu Plus. So when you're looking at Sinu Plus, what is so great about it? What's scientifically proven about it is number one is going to be the role of quercetin. Okay. Quercetin, write that down, everybody. Um, Quercetin is actually a bioflavonoid that's from plants. You can get it from red wine, green tea, right? Berries have a lot of it. Um, But 
quercetin is really important because it can reduce swelling. And we just talked about in asthma, the airways are swelling, the mucous membranes in the airways are swelling, right? So, and not only that, how many, when you get hay fever, your sinuses are swelling, your eyes and wateriness are swelling. Some people's face, entire face, yes. neck. You get, I get it. I, my face actually swells. You can see it underneath my eyes. So, you right. know, there's swelling and you need something that, to help reduce that. Quercetin is a powerhouse ingredient. It really is, but it's not great by itself because it's not highly bioavailable. Okay. So you need um, something with it to make it have the most. Yeah. Effect. This is a scientific principle. You guys, it's not just important to say, here's the scientific mechanism of this thing. We have to think about the delivery method. How does the delivery method help it get into your, through your gut, past your gut into the blood, into the blood vessels, and then circulate throughout your body, getting into the lining of your lungs or your eyes or your ears, nose, and throat, right? So quercetin really needs something acidic like vitamin C, like uh, bromelain with it to actually increase the bioavailability of it. So in this particular product, and we'll just pop out, um, with, in Sinuplast, not only is there quercetin in there, so it's got um, things like vitamin C, like vitamin C acidic, right? But that's not the only reason, right? You're thinking about vitamin C that is acidic. Bromelain is another acid that's derived from pineapple. Mm -hmm. So you want something that has quercetin, but also something acidic in it to increase the bioavailability. In this particular scenario, we got vitamin C, but there is a triple duty that vitamin C does, right? Mm -hmm. Vitamin C, I'm just going to let you guys know, is a natural immune booster, immune balancer, but it is a natural antihistamine and one of the most powerful. And see, that's the thing. A lot of people know that it's an immune booster, right? But you don't always hear about or know about that it really helps with histamine issues as well. Yeah. And what's cool about it is vitamin C is very water soluble. So it can actually go from your stomach straight into your bloodstream relatively easily. However, here are some, here are some things to consider with vitamin C and you want to write this down. So number one, because vitamin C naturally can be very acidic, um, you want to be careful what form of vitamin C that you're doing. So you want a form that's absorbable, but it doesn't burn a hole in your stomach. Mm -hmm. So having forms that are buffered, having, um, having forms that are readily can readily cross the blood bear, blood, um, gut blood barrier really is important. Doesn't damage the mucous membranes. It's important. The other pro issue with vitamin C is dose. Dosing is really key. And people want to know, because there's probably different doses that you would do for maintenance, preventative, when you're having yeah. an attack, and then for kids. So here's the thing. In a product like Sinu Plus, that's an all-in-one, we just want enough vitamin C to help the quercetin be bioavailable, and yet it has some support, right? It's not meant to be the high-dose vitamin C, okay? So it's an all-in-one, has the vitamin C in it to, for bioavailability, but it's not meant to replace somebody taking high doses of vitamin C, which we will get into later. So I'm just letting you know that product ingredients that work, we call it synergistically together, meaning they do good stuff by themselves, but when you put it together, they work 10 times better is what I really look for in something that is a quality supplement or natural product uh, when I'm evaluating it, because the clinical effectiveness of it has to be really good. Not just be like, oh, here's something natural, take it instead of the Claritin. Man, sometimes people's lives are dependent on the Zyrtec and the Claritin. So before you sit here and say, hey, take a natural product, you got to make sure that these, there are ingredients that are working together for maximum benefit, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. in there, we got vitamin C in there. And then here's the thing, you know, there is actually an herb that's really, really helpful in uh, for allergies and asthma. And the name is funny. It's stinging nettle. I think sting, stinging nettle gets a bad rap. Right, <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, you're going to sting me. <laughs> well, because it's actually a weed that grows all over. Right. right. And, and it has little nettles in there. It, the leaves itself, when you touch it, can actually cause almost like little, what do you call those? Like almost like little tiny splinters on it. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting is, is that when the plant is actually extracted in the active ingredients, stinking nettle decreases inflammation like crazy. Um, you can use it as, as for anti-infection. You can even have stinging nettle in a cream that's really helpful for arthritis because of its anti-inflammatory effect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's huge. To me, the number one plant I think about when I think about hate fever, I'm going to think about stinging nettle. Okay. So perfect during any kind of allergic reaction or allergy mm -hmm. season that you're going through. Right. So think of that as another ingredient, right? And so it's in Sinu Plus, right? It is in Sinu Plus. And then lastly, we talk about NAC. 
So N-acetylcysteine, NAC is huge. And I don't know where you've been, if you haven't heard about it, and if you've been living under a rock, clinically, medically proven to be super helpful in helping the liver also break down histamines, number one. Number two, it breaks down mucus. And there's so many diseases and disease states where the mucus plays a big deal, whether it's ear, nose, throat, or lungs, right? And I can tell you from a really serious standpoint, you know, so many of us are just dealing with mucus that we love to get rid of, but somebody with a disease like, let's say cystic fibrosis, which is something I sit on the cystic fibrosis board because I myself am a carrier for cystic fibrosis, as is my husband. So we've really been through a lot with it. And people with cystic fibrosis taking NAC constantly, it has been shown in studies. I mean, you could probably speak to this as a physician, Dr. Maggie, but to really be effective on breaking up the mucus in people's lungs, people with lung disease, I know, take NAC to try to help um, increase their lung function. <laughs> well, but the problem is what are the alternatives? Because if from a physician standpoint, I know all the drugs that are being prescribed for what we call a mucolytic, meaning things that break up mucus. And why fenicin is one of the common ones you could get over the counter. We even do a prescription as a high dose. It's not very effective. Mm. So there are limitations even to the medicines that we're prescribing. So why are we not really utilizing and exploiting the benefits of something as incredible as NAC, right? To thin out mucus naturally, right? Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Something natural can do that and that it's so readily available. Now, is that also contingent upon having to work with certain other synergistic ingredients or can yeah. it do them? So I, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I love developing supplements and thinking it through and NAC for me, because it has such an incredible, um, it's, I love it in many of our, as a major, as an ingredient in many of our supplements because of such the beneficial effects it has on the liver. Right. Uh -huh. Um, and what we call also our detoxification pathways, meaning our body need NAC to actually, uh, it's part of the pathways, um, biochemical pathways to help break down toxins. And when you're talking about smoke and toxins that are coming in the wildfires, the air, the mold, uh, different things are in the air, um, getting NAC in as many ways as you possibly possibly can in a lot of different types of supplements can be, I can help uh, actually these other supplements work better. Yeah. It's, it's so funny. Funny. It helps toxins break down. It's so, it's so important. And I was just being reminded that I had my own doctor's appointment last week. And my doctor said, you know, cause I was experiencing some flares and some things that wasn't going on well with me. She goes, we need to detoxify you. We need to get you back on NAC. So this is, this is great information. And I'm so glad that you have it in so many different forms, but also in sign you plus to be able to help with. Well, why take um, 10 products when you can do one, right? Yeah. So that's why for me, like when you're looking at one combination product for allergy season, I'm going to go with sign you plus. And when we're talking dosing here, just to, just to help you guys out a bit. Um, if someone's in a flare, I'm going to have them take two twice a day. If someone's from maintenance, let's say it's their allergy season, typically it's two a day. I don't know if, if there's anybody out there that has you sign you plus, I would love um, uh, your uh, experience with it. Please share with everybody else. Uh, it's funny because my son, you know, is anti pills. He, he hates medication. He hate, doesn't like even taking supplements. Um, but, um, he's allergic to cats ah. <laughs> and the first thing, and you guys know I'm a cat lover. And wow. so first thing he does when he comes to mom's house is mom, where's the sign you plus, where's the sign you plus? <laughs> the guy that doesn't like taking pills knows that he needs sign you plus because it works so well. Well, that's how I know it works when my son asks for it. <laughs> You're like, if he wants it, you know, it must be good. Hell yeah. <laughs> And if you have questions, feel free to start populating chat with it. I'll leave some time at the end to go through some questions. That'll be really All great. Right. Well, we had a question pop up here. We'll, we'll get back to it at the end. Yeah, that'll be great. So let's, uh, we were just hopping into vitamin C. And so dose, it's the effectiveness of vitamin C on anti-infection properties, um, antihistamine uh, properties can also be dose dependent. So when you're talking a product like Sinium Plus, the vitamin C is actually providing that antioxidant, um, the acidic environment for Sinium Plus to absorb and be more bioavailable, the quercetin in it. But there is such a role in boosting our immune system for cold and flu season and for allergy season with high dose vitamin C. So that's why I look for a product that is has vitamin C in high doses that doesn't burn a hole in your stomach. Yeah. 
That's it's the issue. That's the downside of vitamin C. People just take, you know, say, I want to take C. They don't know how high the dosing needs to be and how that can actually, a lot of over the counter formulations can burn a hole in your stomach. So, so when you're words like highly absorbable, mm -hmm. what, what's the difference between something that can burn a hole through your stomach and a, and a high quality product like what you're offering? Well, uh, buffering. Okay. Buffering is like, if it's something that's buffered, it's really important. When it's buffered, that means that it can actually survive through a, um, through a range of pH. It can be bioavailable. Um, the other thing too, is when you mix in water, how much does it change the pH in the water? So when, once it interacts with water, does it turn into what, what's the pH going to be at? So those are some considerations. So I also like to make it easy, right? So like, for example, I, I like 1000, right? So because I like to, some of the supplement dosing you're talking about is in thousands, right? So vitamin C, it's interesting when you're talking about, for example, let's say cold and flu prevention in an adult, you're talking to two to 3000 milligrams a day. Okay. When you're talking actively having a major virus in your system and you're battling a cold and flu, active infection, then really people can get up to doses of like anywhere from eight to even 10,000. That's crazy ass range to take for sometimes an over-the-counter vitamin C. Wow. Um, that can sometimes really cause stomach upset. It can cause diarrhea. Uh, not fun. Um, <laughs> vitamin C in those kind of doses are so powerful. In fact, we give it IV. I give it, you know, in, in a clinic setting, um, because it can be so hard on people's stomach, we give it as an IV. So some of you guys know you've got an IV therapy. We use high-dose vitamin C in IVs uh, for allergy, for immune boosting, and it's been studied as an anti-cancer treatment, believe it or not, because of its huge anti-inflammatory inflammatory effect and its antioxidant effect, which is really anti-cancer. So it's something to think about when you're picking your vitamin C is you want to be able to take a vitamin C that you can take at higher doses. So mm -hmm. when I look at a powerful C, it says powerful C 1000. So you know, one tablet is 1000. Okay. It's a lot of sense. Correct. So yeah. then like, I think about that it. Right. Mm -hmm. If I'm sitting here and I'm like going through cold and flu season or other people in my family are sick, I'm going to be taking like two to three of those a day, maybe two a day, 2000 a day. Right. But if I am just coming down with it, I would be taking like two of those with a meal, probably about three times a day. Okay. okay. Now why with a meal, it's important to take it with a meal because of what you were talking about with Not first the pH. Okay. Food can buffer the pH, right? Um, food can actually um, be like, Buffering, when you say something is buffered, it means that it prevents it from, something is buffered, it doesn't cause a big swing in the pH when something is added. Okay. So food in itself can be a buffering agent so that even when you introduce something acidic to it, it will, because the food is there and it buffers, the pH, how acidic the environment is, won't swing as much. So I think it's really important to take high dose vitamin C with food, um, buffered and high dose with food, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mrs. Smith says that sounds way better than taking Mucinex. Well, uh, it works better, right? So when you're taking, talking about products like Mucinex, it, it works great for you. That's fine. But like, um, it's guaifenesin. Gua, gua I always have a gua, oh, oh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, yes, it's a strange sounding word. And I know what well, you're and if it works for you, that's great. But we're talking about now other out of the box ways to do it. And so it's not just, you know, like when you're talking about it, um, being helpful, like quercetin and NAC being uh, thinning the mucus. Now you're adding vitamin C at doses where it's really powerfully antiviral, antibacterial. Uh, and you, how can you take it at the doses you need for the right purpose, whether it's prevention or treatment, right? For standard, we're dealing with allergy with a lot of asthma and allergies. 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams a day would be really great for an adult that's going awesome. through some symptoms. And that was my question. As a mama bear and for all the parents out there, you're talking about adults. What about for the kids? What do you yeah. do for dosing for children? This is why for me, like, you know, um, we have a powder for vitamin C. Um, so in the powdered vitamin C, uh, it's another way. Like I like to, I don't like big tablets and I like me personally, I prefer powder chewable or drink it. Right. So this is a drinkable form of vitamin C in an adult. If you're talking about, you know, uh, prevention, it'd be just like one scoop a day and any drink of your choice, just drink it. Right. Uh, in kids, just half the dose, right. Half the dose. It tastes great and it's fizzy. Right. So that's really easy just for prevention. But of course, if you're sick, you want to like double or triple that dose when you're sick. But as a prevention, one scoop a day, this has a ton of vitamin C in it just as one scoop and it tastes great. Okay.
perfect. Right. And, so, and that's helpful information too, because yeah, you're like trying to figure out what do I do for my child? So it's just mm -hmm. basically halving the amount for that an adult would get. And then if they, if the child is getting toward mm -hmm. an adult weight, is that then considered an adult dose that they would be on? Correct. Any child to me that's over 70 pounds, we should start thinking adult dosing. Okay. All right. And then Rose asked the question right here and she was talking about how, you know, for those of us who don't have allergy and asthma, what do you take for prevention? And I'm going to say preventing what, right? And to me, everyone should be thinking about going to cold and flu, flu season and prevention of cold and flu. Yeah. Right? So the kind of dosing for cold and flu prevention is about 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams a day in an adult. So check it out. So in the powerful C, that would be like, you know, two a day, you know, two a day for prevention. When you're talking about the immune CFIS, it actually has a high amount in there. So it's about one, one and a half scoops a day for prevention is plenty and it tastes great. And you guys all know how much I talk about um, dilution um, is really at the most important antihistamine you can do. So uh, the, we have a water challenge. We In our programs, we calculate the exact amount of water you need. So if you're going to be drinking that huge amount of water anyway, why not make it delicious? <laughs> C water, vitamin C water, right? I was just thinking that too. This is helpful for the water, the water intake as well. Right. And when she's talking about what are we preventing, I can tell you from a news standpoint, that mm -hmm. is all we're covering right now, not all we're covering, but a big portion of what we're covering right now is how there is a really big surge right now, mm -hmm. another wave of the virus that mm -hmm. has started in 2019, mm -hmm. um, going around new variants and with all the kids being back in school, they're picking up and creating a lot of other viruses and spreading other things as well. So this is the time. This is the time to get stuff on board and prevent. prevent yeah. it. You don't want to get it. <laughs> oh, here's, an out, here's, here's another out of the box ingredient you guys didn't think about. Who would have ever thought that have any of you thought about how does probiotic serve as an antihistamine for algae, asthma, or wildfire toxins? Well, we're going to talk about that. So let's talk mechanism. So we're going to use like this image to just remind you guys. So we're in the era in science of specific strains for specific purpose. Okay. Okay. So Love here it. is Poflor AI Plus. That's part of the algae collection. Why? Because it contains a specific strain called lactobacillus plantarum, which has been well studied actually to decrease to actually for people with histamine issues, for people dealing with food allergens. So probiotics can actually play a role um, with your gut to actually decrease the amount of histamines or histamine or allergy related reactions. And it's an immune balancer. I love that somebody is in a lab studying this, studying that these different strains can mm -hmm. each have different benefits for your body. And yeah. so one of the benefits of this ingredient, L, what is it now? Lactobacillus planetarum. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> uh, actually helps with allergies and yeah. in inflammation, it sounds like. Yeah. So I think that it's great to take, I, and I've done many trainings around probiotics and, you know, if you're interested in learning more about that type in chat probiotic, or if you've had experience with Profol or AI plus, I'd love to hear what you've had to say about it. But, uh, taking that one day, there's multiple strains in there. And one of the reasons I love that as a form combination synergistic formula is we, I am dealing with a population of people who have either a lot of food related allergy, re mm -hmm. um, reactions or people with mast cell or histamine intolerance, or I'm dealing with people with a lot of environmental allergens. So uh, having that particular strain in there is critical. Okay. Okay. Very yeah. helpful. So what would you recommend then? You would recommend somebody takes uh, one mm -hmm. Proflora AI. Yeah, I think one Proflora AI a day, just generally as a great start, would be a great idea. I think that would be great. Um, in there is also uh, Espiarty, which is another, it's not a uh, pro bacteria, it's actually a pro immune balancing fungi. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful as an anti-infection. So people are talking about, I don't want to get these infections. Well, your gut is actually protecting you from even these viruses we're talking about, cold and flu. Um, so having Espiardi on board in a probiotic is also another great way to deal with this from a, you know, anti-infection -pro protection standpoint, right? So, so I was... Mm -hmm. Rotate that in because I know you talk about having diversity with your probiotics as well. So maybe rotate that in mm -hmm. with whatever other probiotic that you might be consuming. Well, and that's that's what we're is. talking about. Like, you know, in our program, man, we rotate. Typically, I tell people rotate too. So we have people rotate Proflora AI and we have them rotate Proflora GI. I think about Proflora GI is for people who have IBS, no gut infections they're dealing with. Um, and so uh, 
wrote, but generally everybody, Poflor AI and GI is the best rotation to have. Okay. Like, okay. And for then most purposes. I know that I have my child on one as well, because you have one specifically that children or adults who want to help yeah. with their oral microbiome um, can use as well. Yeah. So we have a Profloor chewable. So method of delivery is really important to everybody. Uh, and I think that the hidden, um, there's, you guys are going to be seeing a lot that's going to be merging and I, you're going to hear me so far. I know I'm one of the few docs that are really talking about this. Um, but you're going to see more and more emerge about the dental microbiome, the sinus microbiome, even the eye microbiome. There are actually, these are micro environments with which the bacterial balance in there is makes major. It really is the balance in your immune system and shifts in that really matter. And so interestingly, more and more, I would say six years ago when I started the building the transform programs, we, there wasn't much research. There wasn't any conversation. There wasn't any training or learning or implementation in the role of the dental microbiome or ear, nose and throat. So now more and more because of the training that you're seeing right now and what we're doing in, uh, in the programs and the fact that airborne allergen and people are aware that there's so many um, symptoms from this area, um, the dental microbiome is a big deal. And that's where Proflora chewable really comes in. Delivering a chewable probiotic, you're chewing it, macerating it in your mouth. It's spending all this time in your mouth, in your ear, nose and throat. You want those bacteria to go there. So doesn't it make sense to do a chewable probiotic? Um, so funny. And we've got parents chiming in, like Athena saying she gives it to her son, uh, you know, and now so ha happy to hear that it's helping with allergies. And I, I always have to laugh because when I'm packing my son's lunchbox, I put in there his digest it, his chewable digest it, and his chewable pro flora. And I just have to wonder, like, what are his teachers thinking when they see him open his lunchbox and he's got like all of these chewable pills? He's always thinking his mom knows Dr. Maggie and <laughs> got them hooked up. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's important to hook our kids up because especially, you know, if kids are going back to school right now and we see a surge uh, in September, mid to end of us, uh, mid September to early October. It's a huge surge in viral cold flu. Um, and so what are we going to do to like, for kids who are going back to school? My niece is going back to college. And sure enough, like several people uh, have the virus. And now it's a big deal, their first week of school in college and all this. So I think it's really critical, like we got to watch their backs and we got to be in their corners. So a chewable probiotic, uh, like profilar chewable is really great um, for cold and flu thinking about it. But it also really addresses this whole issue around the dental uh, and the oral, like the ear, nose, and throat microbiome. Right. And these are people that maybe have had chronic sinus problems in their life, things like yes. that. They might be, right, the, the prime target for this. You know, and I don't even know why, but I'm going to ask the audience right now to chime in right now. And then this is a survey or a poll. I'm just going to ask you guys, how many of you have some chronic health symptoms, whether it's autoimmune disease, chronic pain, neuropathy, IBS, uh, mast cell histamine? and you have ongoing or have had a long history of dental problems. Yeah. Just like type it in chat because this is, I'm not making this up. When I bring this up, it's like ding, 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 ding. It's like light bulbs coming out for people. Right. And um, they always say, yes. How did you know, Dr. Maggie? Here's Athena saying, chewable has really helped. Uh, he had an infection bump on his gum that kept coming back and mm -hmm. it helped take it away. Hasn't come back using the chewable proflora. It's fascinating because in kids, there's actually a couple um, diseases that are called Kawasaki syndrome. And, you know, um, there's also um, Kawasaki, there's also Panda, PANS. Um, these are uh, immune system changes that are as a result of strep infection from the ear, nose, and throat. And these strep, the strep actually can trigger these abnormal immune reactions that make kids have um, these syndromes that look like autoimmune disease, which is basically a really like their immune system is starting to attack itself. So it's no joke dealing with these organisms that are in the ear, nose, and throat, specifically species like strep, just so you know. So a pro flora chewable um, is really one great way to protect you or your kids when you know that that, that could be or is an issue for them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, just a lot of a lot of interest in this, uh, Mrs. Smith, wanting the trainings that we. Yeah, I know because I know you've talked a lot about probiotics in the past, and I'm so happy that you're sharing new information here. But yes, there's additional resources if anybody wants to see those trainings we've done. 
about, go ahead. Well, and a lot of people, um, how many of you guys have children that have been dealing with pans and pandas? Because that's a population where there are very few to any medical solutions. And I've worked with a ton of kids with this, and we've been able to turn that around. These are not impossible to deal with conditions, but given the medical tools that we have, their tan hands are really tied. It's really time we think out of the box so we can, we're can we able to address these untreatable conditions in our kids. Yeah. And your question, you said you weren't making this up. So many people are chiming in and saying, yes, that's me. I'm dealing with this, seeding strep since a child and how it's all connected to exactly what you're talking about. Well, the interesting thing is in one of our programs, um, you know, we can act like in one of our programs, you can actually see and I've, I look, I've tested these organisms. And a lot of times when these studies come out, even the lab itself or the doctors that are ordering these labs are dismissing some of these microbes and saying, oh, that's just normal. Mm. Um, normal floor. It is not. And <laughs> it is not. No. Not. It, not it shouldn't be showing up on the other end like this in these numbers. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm the only doc I know that actually looks at this and I'm like, hey, 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 wait a minute. What's going on with your mouth? What's going on with your nose and throat? What's with the medical history? And we tie these pieces together and say, bam, here's the answer. Gosh, I love it. Right? Now, additionally, there are some lifestyle things you can do as well, Dr. Maggie. Well, are you guys ready? Do you guys want to learn how to like allergy proof your home? What are some out of the box ways to decrease allergen load in your home or toxin load in your home? Who wants yeah. that? Type it in chat. And if you know somebody can benefit from that, go ahead and, and tag them in it. And give me a thumbs up right now on this video. Give me a heart on this video. Okay. And let me know you're there. Comment in the comment section. That'll be really great. Yes. So we're going to talk about how can you allergy proof your home or decrease your allergen load. Okay. So let's talk about it. Number one, choose hardwood floors. Okay. Choose okay. Because what's carpet? Does it, does it trap all that stuff? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you guys have one of those Dyson, um, Dyson, uh, vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. Um, but more and more, by the way, there, we have vacuum cleaners that have HEPA filters in there. Um, but I have one of those Dyson carpet cleaners and you can actually see just from carpeting one room, like visually see how much dust and allergen it picks up. Oh. And I am shocked. Like, you know, um, our bedroom is carpeted and you just, you know, literally sweeping through the bedroom that thing, that container is about half full. And I'm like, I can't believe how much, but think about what carpet is. Think about what carpet is. Carpet really is fabric with all these fringes, like literally sponges at the end. And it's like trapping dirt, allergens, oh. toxins, hair. Gosh, <laughs> all of it. And then, yeah. And you think about little kids, right? They're rolling around in this stuff. Well, and here's the interesting thing about the height of the, of the child. So what they actually find is, is that the toxin load, um, I've, I've, you know, in my practice, I've, I've measured the amount of toxin load. And interestingly, I've tested multiple kids in a family. And depending on the height of the child and how far they are from the ground, certain toxins and how much it shows up in their blood is different. Wow. So the lower you are, the higher the toxin? Yes. The lower to the ground you are, the higher the toxin load. And the more people, you know, like kids that are like mouthing things, the higher yes. the toxin load. And I've worked with parents who've dealt with lead exposures, I've, you know, or other toxins exposures. And they're like, no. And then what happens is the toddler on the ground is like the canary in the coal mines and the toddler has the highest load and everybody else has less and less depending on how tall they are. Uh oh, this doesn't bode well for us, Maggie. We're not very tall women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only five foot one. My husband's six three. No wonder he doesn't get sick as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> We're lower to the ground. Well, and Carmel says pets get it bad, but they cause it bad too. Yeah. So here's the thing is, so uh, I, maybe one day I, I would love to do, you know, eight out of the box ways to actually really um, turn around the health of our pets. Um, you know, I, you know, I would love at some point to bridge into those categories. I, I'm like the, I'm the, I'm the curator of random pieces of knowledge into many areas. Gotcha. I can, <laughs> well, you've helped me. I can personally attest to this. You've helped my dog's longevity um, yeah. tremendously, tremendously yeah. when doctors told me he would have been gone already. So, so let's talk about this. Um, um, Carmel saying pets get it bad too. But the interesting thing is having pets in a home is actually a huge source of allergen load for people dealing with allergies, asthma. Um, uh, it's, it's something to think about, um, even mold to some extent. So interestingly is that, um, because pets have dander, 
Right. So, and uh, dander is actually from the saliva of the animal. And so animals that actually clean themselves with their own saliva, now I'm going to do a cat impression. <laughs> These animals that do this kind of thing, they're uh, putting dander all over their body. And so that, break, that brings up a great question because people always say, oh, is this animal, he has hypoallergenic fur, mm -hmm. but really it's, it's the saliva that's also a problem. So is there really not a true animal that's hypoallergenic, right? Well, if that's interesting, right? So, but the, the thing is this, is that the hair becomes a carrier of the dander. Yeah. So it's not necessarily the hair itself, is that the more an animal sheds, the more the dander is sitting on the hair ends up on the floor, on the environment and around. Okay. So yes. So animals like I have a golden doodle and he's hypoallergenic, but here's the thing is as a breed, interestingly, this is random acts of knowledge around dogs. Um, <laughs> even when you're talking about a breed, like a golden doodle breed, depending on the dog and the generation of the dog, they are how far they are from poodle. Uh, some of them have really long, straight hair. Some of them are really curly and don't fall out as often. Mm -hmm. So the level of allergen load, the, um, that even in a hypoallergenic breed depends on the animal and their genetic line and how how much hair really does fall out for them and the shedding okay. mm -hmm. it's the amount of shedding of that hair that you're talking about okay. um so one of the most important things i'm not telling you not to have pets but mm -hmm. i am telling you that is a couple things is number one is choose hardwood floors okay because hardwood floors are going to have less um of that allergen um hold less spongy structures to hold on less filaments to hold on to all that dander and the dust you know um the second thing is is that um if you do have carpet, you want to you want to vacuum with a uh, with a HEPA filtered grade of vacuum cleaner at least twice a week. Okay, that's not something I really ever have given much thought to of having this HEPA grade vacuum filter. Mm -hmm. uh, me and this user, we both use the Roomba, and I have mm -hmm. no idea if that has a HEPA. So probably a good idea if you are experiencing a lot of these problems to invest in something that does have this HEPA grade filter. Well, and even if let's say you do the Roomba and you're like, um, it, let's say it isn't HEPA filter, you can go in once or twice a week, even if you have a Roomba to, with a with a HEPA filter vacuum to do that once a week, twice a week. I recommend twice a week with a HEPA filter vacuum cleaner. And that's, you know, just the vacuum. And if you have hard wood, you don't want to, um, I think, I think sweeping is, is fine, but many people don't even sweep. If you can sweep once a week, um, and we got, I think we should hard mop once a week. I really think using water to actually pick up all the allergens with a hard mop uh, once a week, I think is a really great idea, even with hard, hard wood. That's really important, right? And then let's talk animals, um, brushing your animals. We, okay. Why are we not? So the thing is, is like, you know, how many of us have cats? How many of us have dogs? Right. And we think brushing is for them. Um, brushing is actually to get all that hair on a brush and not all over your floors and throughout your entire home. Right. Makes sense. Makes so sense. really invest in a good brush. Um, I, I, on the dog, I swear there's a coral brush uh, from Chris Christensen best brush ever. And it's really a great brush to brush your animals with. And it picks up so much hair. So really important. I think we should be brushing our, our animals at least twice a week uh, to, to grease allergen load. Jennifer says, I have hardwood and the cats that should, but I have to keep the core cleans at, or allergies will flare. A direct correlation cause and effect, right? I'm not making this stuff up. She's seeing it. Yeah, she's seeing it happen. Okay. Question for you. When you're talking about HEPA filters, I mm -hmm. recently invested on Amazon Prime Day in those air purifiers that yeah. you put in the house. And I recently just noticed, because I've had it running now for maybe mm -hmm. six weeks or so, I noticed that it is attracting dust around it. So do you recommend, but it must be, you know, getting it in and I'm thinking, okay, it is trying to purify my air if it's getting all this dust around it. Do you recommend having those as part of this discussion as well? Getting those? Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, because I do actually, and I have used them. So here's something interesting. Um, and this is about the whole concept around purifying a room, let's say. So I want you to think about like your whole house versus a room. So I want to give you guys a concept here around pollen. So we're talking about seasonal allergies. When do you guys think, when in the day do you guys think there's a highest uh, pollen count? Think about it for a second and, and start typing it in chat. Just think it through. When do you guys think pollen count is actually the highest? Mm -hmm. um, interesting. When do flowers open and when do they close? Okay. Yes. 
The mornings. They open at night and they start closing in the morning in reaction to sun and protection. Thinking about this. Okay. So at pollen count is highest at night, early morning, uh, middle of the night. You start having really high pollen count actually starting already, right? This is minus other conditions like wind or other things, but allergy, um, pollen count tends to be higher in that time. And as it gets hot and the sun is out, you actually see plants closing up in protection. So you'll actually see later on. On less of a pollen count. So I think about bedrooms a lot because um, mm -hmm. that's where we sleep. That's when the pollen count is highest. So number one is what you want to do is think about it is how do I decrease the pollen count while I'm sleeping when the pollen count is the highest? Number one, make sure the windows are closed. Gotta have it closed. When you're sleeping. Number two, which is what you brought up is what about these allergy filters? I do yeah. think it's actually a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody really does have a lot of allergies or let's say there's a member of your household that's allergic to cats, but they ha you have to have a cat in the home. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to put one of these room filters in their room to decrease the allergen load in their room? Yeah. And that's the important thing is I think of these as, as a specific limited space allergen decrease, like decreaser in a limit finite space. It doesn't work as well if you're trying to put one and you have this giant house in a giant room. It's really not going to be that effective. But if you have one confined space, um, putting it on in that space can significantly decrease the allergen load in the airborne allergies in that area of the house. So space um, allergen um, purifiers does have a, have a, a, a it does have, I think, a good function. And I would look for one that where you can put in uh, HEPA filters and you change the filter. But this doesn't make you avoid, like, I don't know why, but like if you have a central um, air conditioning or a heating system, I think it's really important to invest, spend, you know, $10 more per filter, get the HEPA filter. Mm -hmm. And then change them out. Ch don't forget to not change those out. I know sometimes I'll be like, Honey, yeah. have we changed the filter lately? Yeah, I would put a date like me every six months or so, or check with the manufacturer um, with that air purifier and think also about how frequently you run um, your system. And I would make sure you put in your phone a date to change it. Um, what's the point of having a HEPA filter if you don't change it except every two years? It really isn't going to be very effective, right? So make sure you change out those filters. But buy the filter in the first place. That's actually have a HEPA filter that has the microns, the size of the holes are small enough so these pollens can't go through. Um, right. So, and then change them on a timetable that's regular. Get in a cadence where you're changing the um, the filters. All right. Thank you for answering that. Great advice. I know a lot of people are going to be helped by that. Now, when you were mentioning the pollen being higher, you know, at certain parts of the day, and then I'm thinking about it, we're out in the world, you know, we don't stay home all the time. So mm -hmm. we're walking around. We, when we come home, we are probably bringing some of these allergens into the house with mm -hmm. us. So what kinds of things can we do to mitigate that as we are wanting to maybe clean ourselves off, take our shoes off. I'm just, I love this because you're starting to think about you and your body as a carrier of allergens and <laughs> I mean, it, it just makes sense. Right. Because I'm thinking it's probably like in your hair. Yes. Right. <laughs> So one of the most, like if, if anybody in your family have allergies and asthma right now, the first thing they do when they come in the house is take a shower. Okay. <laughs> Get it off. Allergen, whether it's in your body or on top of your body is going to lower the histamine load huge, right? So as soon as you come in, like go and take a shower right away, get, uh, get those clothes, get those clothes um, into a hamper. Um, that is really critical. Um, and if you don't do that, the other thing that you should do is shower before bed. Yeah, okay. Because the bed, believe it or not, we're going to move into the bed. Bedding and the bed is one of the most uh, worst place for allergy exposure for a lot of people, whether it's mold, whether it's pollen, or whether it's environmental pollens. Okay. Yes. And cat hair, all the stuff, animals will sleep on the bed. There's also dust mites. A lot of times it's not even the dust. It's dust mites that actually live in the mattresses and they eat your skin and you're allergic to their poop. Lovely. <laughs> oh, it sounds so delicious and sexy and all of the things. Well, then how do we clean our beds? Uh, yeah. Get a allergenic co cover protector around your mattresses so your skin doesn't fall into the mattress to feed bed bugs or dust mites any of those, right? So the most important thing that you can do for the health of you and your family is actually, you know, go on Amazon, find a good quality um, mattress cover that is, uh, uh, that is 
allergy for allergy that ha the filters it all, but basically prevents the penetration of that in there. So protect your mattresses from all these allergens going in the first place. Such good practical tips that you're giving us. I love it. This will be very helpful. Now, yeah. what about if you have other kinds of exposure in your home, things like I'm sure mold can trigger allergies. Yeah, definitely. And we're going into fall. Um, what happens is certain states, how many guys live in a state where you know there's a high mold? Um, type in chat. Uh, tell me what state that is for you. Here in Oregon and in Washington, and you're looking at Canada, we have a lot of Canadian watchers. Um, moisture mm -hmm. becomes a really, in the British Columbia, moisture, a constant rain uh, around that fall time um, where it's not frozen yet um, is ripe ground for mold. And a lot of people also live in the country or they have barn, uh, they have barns um, or farms, hay. Uh, certain things really attract a lot of mold. So mold exposure is really huge. And living, nothing is living. California, right? California has a lot of mold. And part of it too is the, uh, even though it's a, a lot of people think of California desert, the winds really mm -hmm. Santa Ana's and some of these winds really bring in these allergens and mold from other areas and circulated huge, um, along with the dust. So, yeah. So really importantly, I think thinking about mold is the moisture in your home, the moisture in your home. So really making sure looking at like I think it's a really good idea to take a look. Does your home have a crawl space? What is the drainage situation in on your property and in your home? Is there good drainage? Um, checking the crawl space um, in some of the wettest time, um, you can actually see, is there stagnant water? Mm. And homes here are built uh, with a vapor barrier. And the vapor barrier, it's a plastic cover that covers um, um, below. But the thing is, you got to go down there and make sure that you have an effective vapor barrier. If you live in an area where there's a vapor area, you want to make sure that the, it, it's actually effective. Go in and check there at the wettest time in winter and see, is it actually effectively keeping all the moisture below it? Or is there actually water on top of it? You got big problems if it is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and somebody mentioned you can actually smell um, in the air sometimes the mold. Um, if you want to know what mold smells like going into a barn <laughs> oh boy! in fall, you can smell what the mold smells like. So there is an odor to it as well. So sometimes people can tell by that. So I think making sure looking at the amount of moisture under your house, and then some people have homes where it's a basement in the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you have a basement that's in ground basement, the likelihood there's moisture in the walls is something to think about. Right. Um, so thinking about that, um, is there, you know, is there a lot of mold in that area? Also, if you have leaky roofs, like what's the integrity of your roof, how much is there water that's going down the side of your house that you're not aware of? Um, these are inspections that I think a responsible homeowner and parent or person with health issues should really take a look at. You should do an inspection around your home when it's raining. This, the next giant rain that you have, take a look around your home, take a look at the basement. Look, if you can have a crawl space, go underneath it. I'm we had a leak in our attic. We, I mean, our, our water, our, I guess it's a tankless water heater. I don't really understand it, but <laughs> somehow it still has a tank or something associated with it and the piping and whatever happened with it. I don't know if it was the condensation, but boy, was there a puddle up there. And yeah, we had, we had to mitigate that because just as you're talking about, you have to go and inspect these things. We didn't, yeah. we said, what is that on the ceiling? What's going on yeah. here? I mean, so we're getting into a lot of this stuff. So I wanted to uh, really answer all these questions that you guys had. That was a bunch of great questions. Uh, and we, it like, it's interesting. We're talking about allergies and asthma, but we really started to dive into a lot of these other related issues. We ended up talking about probiotics. We started talking about high dose vitamin C. We talked about cold and flu prevention even because all of these have an impact on actually your alert, seemingly allergic asthma, allergies type symptoms, right? So yeah. Uh, Diane said she had uh, mold in the drywall, um, right? Mm -hmm. And mold, yeah, and you can get mold proof drywall, she said, which mold proof drywall. So these drywall. are some things to really think about. Mm -hmm. Garbellian saying mold actually was a trigger for the mast cell. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So we work a lot in our programs with food mapping and a lot of people think, you know, and it's true food, accurate identification of which foods is triggering the mast cell histamine or your food related reactions is really important. But I think equally important, we need to start thinking about what is coming in airborne, what's in our environment and what's seasonal. And when I'm just thinking about additional supplements, Dr. Maggie, when you were talking about decreasing allergy load, you know, I mentioned it briefly with my son, but is there a role here for digest it as well? 
Oh, thank you. Um, you put the words right out of my mouth. So remember, I talked about how water is dilution, right? And dilution is digestion. I talk about it. Um, I've done a ton of videos around mast cell um, activation, histamine intolerance. And there's a ton of videos around how digestion is the most effective way to actually break down the allergen load in food, right? Um, so using proper digestion is going to decrease what I call the allergy threshold. So digest it when I'm thinking about it. Um, when you, these are additive, right? So food allergies will raise your histamine levels to a certain amount, and then you add the environmental on top of it. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if you lower with better digestion, you take digested one with small meals, two with big meals, and overall every single meal, you are decreasing your allergen load. So instead of sitting here all the time, you're down here, you could have mold, you could have pollen come in, you could have a dog or a cat, but it doesn't raise it to the threshold right at my lip. Above that, you're going to start having allergic symptoms. We could still be below that threshold where you actually have a big reaction. So overall, I want to look at different tools with which with a multimodal approach, we have a system with which we are decreasing allergen load in every direction. So even when you are forcibly exposed to it seasonally or in an environment, things that you can't change, you're going to be okay because your baseline is so much lower. You add those things in, you're still not up here yet. Okay, perfect. So that is absolutely helpful, just along the same lines of dilution and getting the allergens through and out your system. Correct. Okay. There was one question that we were going to circle back to. I am not familiar with this. You may not be, but you may be an herb called mullene. Are you familiar with that herb? I am not. And I don't know, know if the name, if it's the name of a product. So I can't answer that one, unfortunately. Okay. So Thank you for sometimes the Sometimes, uh, sometimes I don't know every herb on the planet. I know right. the ones that work really well and the ones that really work together. Uh, sometimes people will throw brands at me and I don't know every brand on the market or the ingredient in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Car Carmel says that digestive was a game changer for me and, and Carmel share what kind of game changer it was, you know, like people think, Oh, it's just my digestion is going to get better. Carmel can share with you what it did actually for her. Um, I did a lot of videos around digestion and some trainings around digestion. If this is a hitting a nerve with you around digestion, if you want more from what I'm digestion, write more info on digestion or put digestion in the chat. Uh, and our team will get the information to you and share the trainings with you. And if you're watching from YouTube, just hit it, put up, Dr. Maggie and digestion. And you'll probably have like 20 videos that are going to pop, pop up um, or a playlist even uh, on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're watching this and you have not um, checked out our YouTube channel, I'm going to add a link here to our YouTube channel in chat. I am going to ask you guys, we're getting near 10,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. And I would love for you guys to go to our, um, we have a transform YouTube channel. We have an MYMD channel. Go to our transform YouTube channel right now. We'll share a link in chat and give a subscribe to that channel. I want to get us over 10,000 subscribers by let's say the end of September. Let's do that. <laughs> I love it. And Rose just echoing that to go watch your videos because she says also digest it will change your life if you have constipation. Also, <laughs> Dr. Maggie's food mapping, watch the videos, get educated on this. All right, everybody. I think that is a wrap. We've been talking for over, almost an hour. And so I hope you guys found value in that. And if you did give a follow to uh, give a subscribe to our YouTube channel and a thumbs up and give a thumbs up to this channel and tag somebody, you know, that can benefit from this information. Thank you for all of the practical tips and for helping us to get through this season with less symptoms and no trips to the ER. <laughs> Else the no on that. All right, everybody. That's a wrap. Have a wonderful day.